welcome along everybody so i haven't had time to do much uh, lately um if there's some great images um on the padlet so if you've got any images that you've taken pop them on there and uh have a look so it's a little while since i looked because uh, i've been so busy but uh have a pop and have a look and just use the link there stargazing.co.uk forward slash padlet and have a look at all the latest images that are starting to appear when we get some clear skies that is of course all waiting for those aren't we um <clears throat> there are other meetings so there's reach out and touch space which are now on a monday evenings only it was monday and thursday um but now monday evenings at eight o'clock so have a look for Astro Radio and reach out and touch space. And if you want to go live on the panel, Roger, are you still on the panel there? Oh, yes, I'm on the panel. Yes. Yeah. OK, so Roger's on the panel. But Thanks. we're only meeting on the on the uh, on the Mondays now because uh, Pete's got uh, is winding down for his retirement and all his um, Zoom meetings and in-person meetings. He's just deciding to start winding it down a bit so uh, we, we only have the meetings on the monday usually yeah. he did a bit too much didn't he yeah time. so but he's uh, still very very active with his uh, talks yeah yeah so that's monday evenings at eight o'clock reach out and touch space the other one i know, I know um mike is not coming in tonight is ghost space watch um and they've got uh, a number of talks that mike organizes for that and the next one is seaborne launch the optimal space delivery solution for the uk so go to ghostspacewatch.co.uk this one does cost it's three pound a time um but uh yep mike's organizing that as well anything else anybody like to uh, mention before i go on to everything else no, any events I know of that I haven't mentioned. As I say we've got a lovely Christmas present. We got the Web Space Telescope up there, which was fantastic. Marvellous. Um, <clears throat> I've got my diary on uh, Team Up. So if you want to go there, look at what's up in the sky. There's also um, events like this and any other things I can find that go on there as well that you can attend. And there's also um, the Phil helps me with is some of the memorable space dates that go on there as well so three diaries on there and you can see them here so the blue one is all the things you can see in the sky the red one any events that I hear of and any dates notable dates and you can see there's a few there and that's for December I need to update that slide but there you go that's where it is so go to stargazing.co.uk forward slash diary and you can download the team up app and carry it all around with you so it's always up to date and if you want to be alerted to any events that we're doing um just go on to the uh virtual astro club website and uh, you can just sign put your name and email address in and when i've got something to send out which i don't do very often um you'll just get emailed when there's going to be an event and most of our meetings are going to be on the third tuesday in the month this one's a little bit different because uh, i've had to sort of jiggle it around to fit in with other things i'm doing um so it's usually for third tuesday in the month the next meeting is the 15th of february and that's going to be four, paul fellows are going to be talking about snowball earth there's a few more details on the website if you're interested in what that's all about uh, 22nd of march that's delayed a week and we've got Steve Tonkin coming in and he's going to be talking about our favorite unfavorite topic light pollution and he's talking going to talk about the right light at night so uh, that should be quite an interesting talk as well mm. 19th of April might be uh, good for Chris who's joining us for the first time uh, we've got a practical session so if you've got any ideas for the practical session um, let me know um, and we'll try and fit something in. So if you've got any questions about astronomy, equipment, astrophotography, whatever, just send them in and uh, we'll try and put a practical session together for you so we can uh, answer some of those questions. And for those practical sessions, you can submit your suggestions or questions from a link on our uh, website and that's also stargazing forward slash questions and you can submit the question or even a 
comment or e or su suggestions for future events or even speakers if you know of a good speaker we can fit in for next time so the next lot of sessions then we can do that as well um so the future meetings hold on uh, yep yeah, the oh, Yep, the, and the last one is 17th of May, Karen Jaffa, who's going to talk about two-eyed seeing, ancient and indigenous astronomy from across the globe. So all the stories in the, scar, in the stars uh, from different um, societies throughout the world, which is really, really interesting talk. So to tonight's meeting, we've got Phil sitting in the wings. He's going to talk about NASA does nostalgia. So it's all about the... Uh, things that NASA have launched into space that probably you wouldn't have thought of. So uh, unless anybody's got any questions or would like to say anything before Phil starts, it's over to you, Phil. Okay, thank you then. I'll stop you sharing. I have to share the sound. Remember to do that. <laughs> That's the bit I always forget. <clears throat> okay, so can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this talk really stemmed um, probably just under a year ago now because of the uh, the Ingenuity helicopter that was on Mars. And one of my society members was talking on our society chat about, um, did you know that part of the, um, the Wright Brothers uh, canvas is actually on the Ingenuity? And I went, oh, yes, I did. And NASA have done other stuff like that. And I started listing them. And before we knew it, there was so many, I thought, oh, I can make a talk out of that. So we discussed it and they said, oh, I'd like to hear that talk. And they even gave me the working title of NASA Does Nostalgia. So I've made the, um, uh, the logo to try and encompass all of the, the, uh, the things that NASA have done over the years. Um, and um, yeah, done some research, um, learned a lot along the way. So I'll try and uh, portray some of those um, probably unusual things. Some of them you'll know and some of them hopefully um you won't have heard of before we'll see how it goes so as we all know nasa is deep in tradition being sort of like an, uh, an air force background and um and that kind of thing so one of the things that they do is they have lucky peanuts now the good luck peanuts themselves um made their first appearance in uh, 1964 during the ranger 7 mission um, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory had six failures up until that point. So for the next launch, Ranger 7, there was pressure to succeed. So on launch day of Ranger 7, uh, a mission trajectory engineer named Dick Wallace passed out some peanuts at Mission Control. And he said, I thought passing out peanuts might take some of the edge off the anxiety of the mission. And the rest is history, he says. So they've now... Um, passed peanuts out at launches ever since. Now, up until the Voyager mission, the peanuts only showed up at launch, but nowadays you normally see them at critical parts of uh, uh, missions, flybys and landings, or anything that's got high anxiety and risk. So that's uh, the lucky peanuts as part of their tradition as well. Um, beans are go. Now, this is a much celebrated um, Kennedy Space Center tradition that started back with the STS-1, the first space shuttle launch. Now, after the first shuttle launch in um, April 1981, launch controllers enjoyed beans and cornbread as an immediate payoff for a successful launch. Uh, former NASA test director Norman Carlson started the tradition with one small crock of pot of northern beans for his hungry staff and the tradition grew in popularity and eventually he handed it over to the Kennedy Space Centre food contractors um, and they did it after every launch. Um, probably a more well-known one is the, uh, the launch meal. So for American astronauts that were launching from the Kennedy Space Centre, they always had a meal before they went up of steak, eggs and cake, no matter when um, the takeoff was scheduled for. Um, it's a tradition that went all the way back to Alan Shepard when he became the first American in space because the, uh, the meal itself was a high protein meal that was designed to fill him up while he was um, uh, in low Earth orbit and um, uh, he wouldn't have to relieve himself for a few hours so that would help him to uh, sort of control his bowels. 
Um, and another one, cutting the ties. Now, this guy on the left to me always looks like Paul Money. It's not, but he does. Um, so one of the um, other uh, KSC traditions, Kennedy Space Center traditions, um, that doesn't involve eating is cutting the neck tie off a, uh, a rookie after launch. So the customary practice, it used to be among aviators to do this um, following their first solo flight, but then was adopted by NASA um, uh, and the test directors took the, uh, the neckerchief uh, and cut it off just under the knot uh, with some scissors in front of the entire launch team when the launch went up. So that's just a few things that NASA are deep in tradition for. But they also send things into space, and I've tried to categorize them into three, uh, four parts. So they send things for extraterrestrial messages for human existence. Now, not just to extraterrestrial beings, but also um, to be out there for us to collect later on, as you'll see. So future generations of humans will, could go out and collect some of these things that we've put into space. A bit like we did with the, uh, uh, the Ranger when the um, Apollo 12 went up as it landed near the Ranger and brought some of it back. So you get the idea for that. And there's mementos or exhibition pieces that they send up, bring back, and they either keep them as keepsakes or put them in museums. Contraband, now I don't mean drug smuggling. Uh, I mean things that they've taken on board that aren't actually legally part of the flight manifesto. And then of course, PR stunts to try and uh, raise the profile of space and potentially even a company. So. I'm going to um, uh, tackle these in chunks. Uh, and the first one I'm going to talk about, I'm going to look at the things that happened during NASA's golden age. So really we're looking at the, uh, the 1961 to 1972 period of, uh, uh, from Mercury to Apollo. <clears throat> now, Mercury, uh, Project Mercury was the first human spaceflight program uh, from the US and it ran from 1958 right the way through to 1963. The seven astronauts were chosen and called the Mercury Seven. Um, there were six flights in total because uh, Dick Slayton was grounded due to an irregular heart rhythm. Uh, and in March 1972, he was medically cleared and he um, flew on the 1975 Apollo Soyuz test project. Now, part of the Mercury program <clears throat> uh, included some of these early mementos. Now, monetary souvenirs of accompanying astronauts. Uh, nearly every space flight up until um, the space lab days. Uh, Mercury astronauts carried small, lightweight mementos on their missions, often used, often in the form of um, uh, United States coins or uh, uh, banknotes. Now, on the first suborbital flight, um, Freedom 7, Alan Shepard carried with him four $1 silver certificates, which were subsequently signed by him and other Mercury astronauts and support staff and becoming what's called short snorkers. Now a short snorter is a banknote inscribed by people traveling together on an aircraft. And it's a tradition that started back in the um, Alaskan bush, bush flyers back in uh, the 1920s. Um, it spread into the military and then into commercial aviation and, uh, and then on to NASA. Um, the dollar bills were used to meet the FAI, FAI regulations in flight recordings due to the uncertainty of Yuri Gagarin's flight, because when Yuri Gagarin landed, he actually ejected from his capsule uh, and came down uh, outside of the spacecraft, which really was outside FAI regulations. So what they did is they signed these dollar bills, put them in the spacecraft, so that when the spacecraft went up and came back down again, they could check and verify that it was the same spacecraft. So it was used as um, uh, an early way of checking, but these days we've got flight recorders and film and footage and all sorts going on now, but this was what they did uh, back in the early days. <clears throat> now, Liberty Bell 7, which was the second one that went up, um, traveled to the edge of space in 1961 on the uh, during a successful suborbital flight before returning to the Earth. Now this had um, uh, Grissom on it, uh, and he took with him these two 1944 winged Lability Head Dimes. Um, these were recovered in uh, 1999, in July the 20th, 1999, because it wasn't 
made news until the 21st of July 1999 because the 20th of July 1999 wasn't a slow news day for space um, because it was the 30th anniversary of Apollo. And what had happened was when the uh, capsule came down, the hatch blew inexplicably uh, and water started pouring in and it became so heavy that the helicopter couldn't lift the spacecraft back out of the sea. Uh, so it went down into the ocean and Gus Grissom's suit filled up with water as well. And he was waving at the, uh, the helicopter and nearly died. Um, but managed, they managed to get him, but they couldn't save the spacecraft. So after 38 years at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, they managed to recover it, uh, reeled it in, and some of these coins were on board. Uh, Friendship 7 was the next one that went up. This was John Glenn, who became the first American to orbit the Earth in his uh, Mercury Atlas 6 um, with his Friendship 7 capsule as part of the Mercury program. Now, along for the ride on that mission were $32 and $2 bills that were uh, secretly uh, put on board by the launch support crew. They'd signed the bills uh, and wished John Glenn good luck uh, on his flight. And they taped them around the internal wiring and the bills were famously signed then by John Glenn and formalized flight certificates were made to prove they were flown. So lots and lots of um, uh, money going on there. Um, so that was the Mercury. And then we moved on to the Gemini missions. The Gemini was uh, NASA's second human spaceflight program. And it was the one that carried two astronauts into low Earth orbit. Um, and there were 10 crews and 16 individual astronauts that flew on those between 1965 and 1966. <clears throat> uh, Gemini 3 was the first US mission to carry two astronauts as part of this Gemini program. Um, on this particular flight, Gus, Gus Grissom took his 1964 Roosevelt silver dime with him. Um, the dime was uh, carried especially for Guta Vent, who was the, uh, the pad leader during 1960 to 1975. Now, after the mission, Grissom scratched the flight initials GT3, which you can see on there, uh, onto the surface of the coin. Uh, adjacent to um, Franklin Deed Roosevelt's head, as you can see on there, and presented it to Vent. Now, the Gemini packages, the, the, the food that they got there, just was a freeze-dried entree, uh, vegetable, drink, and a dessert, all protected in a four-pie laminated film coating. Um, Young wasn't really interested in this freeze-dried option, so we bought something else on board. He'd slipped a corned beef sandwich into his pocket just before launch. He claimed that his contraband sandwich was thanks to uh, Wally Shira, who prepared it at a local restaurant at Cooker Beach um, just before the Gemini 3 launch. Now, Shira was well known as being a practical joker um, and said he was bored with the official menus and uh, it seemed like a good fun idea at the time. Um, the the corned beef sandwich, sandwich sparked a, a brief conversation during their six hour mission, um, but only lasted about a minute. So the 50 year old corned beef sandwich is preserved in uh, resin. And as you can see there, it sits on a table at the, uh, the Virgil Gus Grissom Memorial Museum in Indiana. Now, Gemini 6 was um, uh, a mission that went up in December 1965 and had the two astronauts of uh, Wally Shirar and Tom Stafford. And it rendezvoused the previous day with the Gemini 7 mission um, and their fellow astronauts, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. And it was the first crewed space rendezvous in history. Um, and Gemini 6 reported something really odd just before re-entry. Roger, you're Gemini 7, this is Gemini 6. Uh, we have an object Looks like a satellite uh, going from north to south, up in a polar orbit. Uh, he's in a very low trajectory, traveling from north to south, and has a very high finest ratio. Looks like it might even be a, uh, a photo stand. Very low, looks like maybe going to the energy uh, Stand by one. Looks like he's trying to stick with him. Got him too, six. <laughs> that was live. 
Now, this was just a practical joke that was set up by the uh, the Gemini 6 crew uh, who practiced it just before takeoff. And in 1967, Wally Sherrard donated his little tiny, um, uh, little tiny Horner harmonica, as you can see there, to the uh, National Air and Space Museum, the Smithsonian Museum. And according to the Smithsonian Magazine, together they're considered the first musical instruments ever played in space with Jingle Bells being the first ever performance. Um, flight line medallions are a, a little bit like currency, but they're sort of like um, uh, collectible coins. Um, now, beginning with the first crude of uh, the Gemini missions in 1965, the commemorative medallions were prepared for astronauts at their request. Um, it, it's unclear who started to prepare them, but what you did is you got each box that uh, contained a medal and it had the word flight line on the front. Um, it's unknown how many were um, made of gold and silver of each particular flight um, because they weren't, they didn't have serial numbers on them. So they're not really good for collectors. So they were prepared for each crew as well as the ill-fated Apollo mission, um, but none of them can contain serial numbers. So as I say, they're difficult to track, trace and certify. So they're not really um, good for collectors. So we're moving on to the Apollo days now. Don't need any introduction on this. We all know what happened during the uh, the Apollo when we uh, uh, put man on the moon. But probably the most or the most famous one of them is when we set foot on the moon on Apollo 11. Now it contained um, various um, bits and pieces. I've, I've got some of the more uh, interesting ones here. Um, there was a silicon disc here um, that was the it was the size of a, uh, a US half dollar coin. Uh, and it was engraved on the disc um, electronically uh, in writing so small that you could read it with a microscope. And it was goodwill messages from 73 countries around the world, including Queen Elizabeth II, Indira Gandhi, Pope John Paul VI, um, and uh, uh, lots of um, uh, congressional and uh, NASA leaders. Uh, there were two medals that were put down by uh, that were uh, medals from the Russian cosmonauts Yuri Gagarin and Vladimir uh, Komarov. The widows had, the widows had given the medals to the American astronaut Frank Borman, who passed them on to the Apollo 11 crew to put them uh, onto the surface. There was also an Apollo 1 patch, um, which was uh, the ill-fated uh, mission that um, caught fire on the launch pad. So uh, another commemorative um, piece put down. And there was a small olive branch because the olive branch is a uh, symbol of peace. And there were pieces of the Wright brothers plane. They stayed in lunar orbit on the lunar module. Uh, and then they were brought back uh, and are on display, as you can see on that package there at the Smithsonian Museum in America. Um, Apollo 12. Now, Apollo 12 uh, contained a silver astronaut pin that was left by uh, Albine in honor of another astronaut or, or astronaut Clifton Williams. Now, Williams was served as the backup pilot for Gemini 10 on the uh, July 1966 mission. Following this mission, he was selected to be lunar module pilot for the Apollo mission. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he was killed in a plane crash in October and Albine became the lunar module pilot. So he left that there uh, in honor of Clifton Williams. Uh, on Apollo 14, uh, sorry, Apollo 13 even, Apollo 13 was a, uh, a microfilm Bible that flew around the, uh, the moon on Apollo 13. And it later landed on the surface on Apollo 14. Now, the, uh, the commander of Apollo 13, Jim Lovell, he carried 512 of these stamp-sized Bibles um, that were supposed to land on the moon, but didn't after their oxygen tank exploded and severely damaged the spacecraft. So most of those Bibles were cut up, distributed among dignitaries over the years. Um, but there were, uh, uh, from a collection of about 100 Bibles, there was only about half a dozen that made it back to the moon in uh, 1971 uh, on Apollo 14. And then famously on Apollo 14, Alan Shepard hit two golf balls on live television at the end of his Apollo 14 moonwalk. Um, it was a one-handed chip from a, uh, a converted Wilson staff six 
iron um, and adapted from a moon rock sampler. So you can see that there that we got the club on the end and the uh, and there's um, uh, I don't know if that's the actual golf ball. I don't think they've got a bag. It's just a representation of what the golf ball was. Now a lot happened on Apollo 15. Um, so in 1971, um, there was a church in Texas that gave a Bible to a parishioner to take on a business trip. And that parishioner was David Scott, who ended up taking it to the moon and leaving it on the lunar rover control panel, which you can see on there. And then there's a little plaque at the, uh, at the church to say that it's been taken to the moon. So, yes, there is an actual Bible on the moon, as well as the, uh, the microchip versions. Also, they took a statue of the fallen astronaut, which is a, a three and a half inch aluminium figure. Um, it's small stylized figure, and it's meant to depict an astronaut in a spacesuit intended to commemorate the astronauts and cosmonauts who died in the advancement of space exploration. That was commissioned and placed on the moon by the crew of Apollo 15 at Hadley Real. And next to it was a plaque of the 14 men known to have died during the advancement of space. Uh, the crew kept the memorial existence a secret until after completion of the mission and after public disclosure, the National Air and Space Museum requested a replica of the statue. Controversy soon followed as Van Hoyndok, who made the statue, uh, claimed a different understanding of the agreement made with the astronauts and attempted to sell 950 copies. But he finally relented under the pressure of NASA, which has a strict policy of not having any commercial exploitation of the government space program. And probably the most famous one is the crew took 398 postage stamp covers with them on their trip to the moon uh, with the intention of selling them to uh, a German stamp dealer named Hermann Seeger. After returning to the Earth, out of the stamp collection, 100 would be sold to the German dealer, with the other 298 being kept by themselves as souvenirs. Uh, the crew stamps were duly confiscated by NASA and became known as the Seeger covers once the details of their arrangements with the German stamp dealer were revealed. So, yes, naughty, naughty. They got reprimanded over that. Um, now, Apollo 16 saw Charlie Duke take his first steps on the moon. Uh, he was only 36 at the time, and at the moment, he's still the youngest human in history to have ever walked on the surface of the moon. But while he was on the moon, he left a family portrait of him, his two sons and his wife, which remains on the moon to this day. And on the back of the photo, he wrote, as I depicted on there, this is the family of astronaut Charlie Duke from the planet Earth, who landed on the moon the 20th of April, 1972. Um, Apollo 17, so the crew of Apollo 17 carried small flags from 135 different countries and 50 US states. Uh, samples of the rock that were brought back from Apollo 17 were gifted to nations and they were called the Goodwill Moon Rock. Now each rock is encased in an acrylic button mounted to a plaque and in, um, put on there with the, uh, the recipient's flag. Uh, and this one that's on, that, that we've got pictured here is the one that's on display at the Natural History Museum in London. So if you get a chance, go down and have a look at it. Um, now, the Robbins medallions were sort of like the next stage of the flight line medallions. So these started from Apollo 7, um, Apollo 8, on uh, Apollo 7 onwards, yet. Yeah. Um, and these ones actually did have um, serial numbers on them. Um, they were gold or silver. The gold ones could be bought by members of the crew and the silver ones were bought by members of NASA who uh, wanted to purchase them. Um, they had the, uh, the, the flags and the logos and the names of the um, uh, missions on it. But because they were struck so far in advance, if there are any changes to the mission, it was very difficult to replicate that in the uh, Robbins medallions. Um, some of the more uh, famous issues that they had with uh, the Apollo 13 one, where uh, one of the crew at the last minute uh, got taken down with um, uh, the measles or, or, or suggested to have the measles, but didn't in the end. Um, and then, of course, the, um, they didn't actually land on there. So when you look back at the other flight medallions, they've got the, uh, the landed date on there. But because of Apollo 13 didn't land, when they got the coins back, they restructured them changed the name and then replaced the landing date 
with the name of the Aquarius and Odyssey, which was the um, uh, lunar module and the um, uh, service module. Um, another one that was late, so the Apollo 11, the famous um, uh, logo on there, uh, originally had the um, olive branch in the beak of the eagle, um, and then NASA didn't like it because it made it look menacing as it was going to be landing on the moon. So they moved it from the beak into the talons so it didn't look as menacing. But obviously the uh, Robbins medallion had already been made, so um, it wasn't changed and still looks like that today. And as I said, the gold ones were bought by the crew. So probably the most famous one of them all is this one, which is the, uh, the gold Robin medallion from the Apollo 11 that Neil Armstrong actually had. And now it's been encapsulated and stored in a secure place because it is so precious because of the history of um, uh, space flight. So that's the Robin's medallions. Um, and we're moving on to a little bit more during the Skylab era of the 1970s, NASA decided to use paper certificates that were designed by the Johnson Space Centre, uh, and they were used instead of money, as these were believed to be less of a commercial appeal. To, um, so it stopped all of the problems that they had. And to this date, NASA astronauts are prohibited from carrying currency of any kind into space as a personal souvenir or memento, so they can't cash in. <laughs> So that's the early days of um, NASA. We'll move on to some deep space exploration now. So we've got the, the ones that have gone uh, sort of like beyond the uh, asteroid belt. Um, and uh, probably uh, the pioneer uh, ones, the pioneer. There we go. So in the, um, in the 1970s, um, Pioneer 10 was the first spacecraft to travel through the asteroid belt and the first to make direct observations of an outer planet. Uh, Pioneer's 10 mission was to study Jupiter's atmosphere uh, and also have a look at Io and the solar winds. And launched just over a year later after its sister spacecraft, Pioneer 11 was the second spacecraft to explore the outer solar system. And the spacecraft used Jupiter's gravitational um, assist to slingshot it out towards Saturn. And Pioneer studied the masses, interiors, atmospheres of the rings and of course uh, of Jupiter and Saturn. But they both carried uh, the Pioneer plaque. Um, they were identical gold plaques and they were intended to serve as messages to extraterrestrial life so that when they went out into the interstellar space. Um, now it contained uh, the messages of here which is the uh, the hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen. So I'll, uh, I'll cover that when I get onto the um, uh, Voyager plaque. Um, the relative distance of the sun from the center of the galaxy, which is, uh, so there's the sun and then there's us, and it tells you where the, uh, the pioneer had come from, plus a map of 14 pole stars with their periods donated as they went across. It also contained uh, a human man and a woman figure uh, in relation to size-wise the, um, the Pioneer spacecraft itself. Um, the two people that designed it were Carl Sagan, who was uh, a very famous TV personality and scientist at the time, and Frank Drake, who was the founder of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now Voyager, uh, were the space probe probes that were originally uh, going to be part of the Mariner program, but then they changed them and sent them on the Voyager program to its planetary grand tour back in the 1970s. And the grand tour would take advantage of the alignment of the outer planets um, so that the, uh, the alignment where the planets were all lined up only takes place every 170 years and it'd make possible the use of gravitational assists from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune to propel the spacecraft uh, out to the solar system at a very, very fast rate, plus do flybys of them all at the same time. So this is what Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were to do. But both spacecraft carried a 12 inch gold phonograph record that contained pictures and sounds of the earth. Uh, also symbolic directions on the cover uh, and also directions on how to, uh, instructions on how to play it. Uh, and the record was intended as a combination as a time capsule and an interstellar message to tell um, uh, extraterrestrial beings where we were 
and what we were like. And the contents of this record were all selected by a committee that was chaired by the aforementioned Carl Sagan. So the gold record cover itself, uh, it was electroplated um, uh, uranium because the radioactivity of this decayed at a steady rate so that any um, extraterrestrial being could then measure the amount of decay and work out how long it was before um, the uranium was put on there and then work out, uh, potentially calculate the time elapsed since the remain, uh, uranium was placed on the spacecraft. Now, um, this is the, uh, the disk itself um, and this part of the disk this diagram is the uh, the 14 pulsars uh, of known directions from the sun. So it's a similar one that was on the Pioneer, but then they replicated it onto the, uh, the Voyager disk and the distances there are uh, represented in binary. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is the lowest states of the hydrogen atom. Now, the vertical lines uh, with the dots indicate the spin um, of the proton and the electron. And every 100 million years or so, the electron and the hydrogen atoms flip and cause a change in frequency. And this change in frequency is um, accurate enough. It's exactly 21 centimeters and it's called the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. Now, when you convert 21 centimeters into Hertz, you get 1,420 megahertz which is 7.042 seconds, 10 to the minus 10, or 0.7 nanoseconds. So that transition time from one state to another provides a fundamental clock reference used um, on the cover um, and helps you decode the pictures. And it's so important that I'm gonna place that reference at the top for the rest of the slides as we decode it. So this is the side view, and these are written in binary. So you've got your one zero zero one one zero zero, and as we go along, so that's what it that's what it comes out at. So that's what it converts to, and if we times that by our magic number, we get three thousand two hundred and twenty nine seconds, which is fifty three point eight two minutes, and that is the total runtime of the record. The bit at the top is the top view and the top view again if you convert it into binary one zero zero one one zero 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 there we go all the way around and what we end up with is that number times it by our magic number at the top there and it gives us 3.59 seconds which is the time for one revolution so what we're doing is we're slowly decoding the record to give them instructions on how to calibrate it so that they'll be able to listen to it. And then once they've calibrated it and got those two going, they'll be able to hear greetings in 55 languages. They'll also be able to hear uh, a 12 minute montage of sounds of the earth, which includes things like whales, birds, um, and um, the, uh, the greetings even include Carl Sagan's son, Nick Sagan, who did the, um, the greeting in English. And also there's music on there as well, which includes people like Bach, Mozart, Chuck Berry, Johnny B. Good, and other traditional songs from around the world. So that's the front side. But the B side, if you decode that, um, you can turn it into pictures, a bit like a fax machine. So let's now decipher the other side. So the right hand side of the record, um, you've got the waveform and it's broken up again into binary. So if we open up that into binary, there's our binary numbers, times that by our magic number at the top there, and it gives us 0 0.08 milliseconds. And that is the time between the wave peaks on here. We've also got this bit down here, Again, if we translate that into binary, we have one, two, three, and it takes you up 512. So if we times that by our number, it tells you that that's the number of scan lines, 512, that's on the, uh, the, the disk to make up a complete image. And if you put those two bits together, um, you can then use the bottom one, because if you decode the first image and it looks like a circle, 
that looks like that circle on the front cover, that means that you've calibrated it right. So I don't know if that would be successful for extraterrestrial life, but that's how the thinking was. And that is the golden record cover of the Voyager spacecraft. So we were brought up thinking that the answer to life, the universe and everything was the number 42, where in fact, it's the number 21. Uh, moving on to another mission that went out into the deep space was the New Horizons. Now, this was launched in January 2006 as a mission to understand um, the world at the end of our solar system and on into the Kuiper Belt, uh, including Pluto, which at the time was a planet. But then in August 2006, it was downgraded to a dwarf planet. Um, so at the time of its launch, it was on course to the ninth planet. And it does hold nine secrets um, it holds nine secrets because it's the ninth planet at the time um, first one in the corner up here this is the ashes of clive tombaud who discovered the plate who had discovered the planet pluto back in 1930 um, the next two along here are two cd roms now one contains a photo of the mission team and the other contains names of space fans who put their names forward to um, be flown out to the Kuiper Belt and onto uh, Pluto. The fourth one there is uh, apart from uh, a piece from Spaceship One, which was the uh, the first um, private initiative of trying to get um, humans into space. Um, so a bit like the what Elon Musk and um, uh, Benson, uh, uh, sorry, Elon Musk and um, uh, Virgin Galactic is trying to do now, uh, and Jeff Bezos. Uh, the fifth one here is a stamp from the um, uh, the US proclaiming that Pluto has not been explored. So the irony of sending a stamp saying Pluto has not been explored to explore Pluto, the NASA thought that was quite funny. Uh, the next two, six and seven, are uh, coins. Um, they were uh, two coins from two different US states um, because they represent where uh, New Horizons was built and where New Horizons was born. Uh, New Horizons was launched. So that's Maryland and a Florida state coin there. Uh, eight and nine were the uh, two versions of the US flag. Um, so it sent two different versions there. So they're the nine secrets. But I wasn't going to be really talking about scientific instruments during this talk. But uh, uh, this one I'm going to make an exception because this is a, a student dusk counter that was sent uh, and it's called Venetia Burney. Now, Venetia Burney is the person who discovered, or, or the person who um, gave its name, gave Pluto its name, allegedly, um, back in um, uh, the 1930s. So, yes, it's quite poignant that they named a, uh, a scientific instrument after Venetia Burney. We're going out to the gas giants a little bit further now, or oh, we're going out to the gas giants just, just beyond the um, uh, asteroid belt. We've got uh, the Cassini mission. Now, the Cassini mission was uh, a spacecraft orbited Saturn in 2017, did some fantastic work um, and um, was then deorbited uh, five years ago in 2017 uh, on its grand finale. I can't believe that was five years ago, but did some amazing work. Um, but what did it contain? Well, it contained a DVD of about 615,000 signatures of people that had um, sent them in from different nations. Um, now, the disc cover itself uh, shows flags of 28 of the 81 nations of people that sent signatures in. Um, the planet Saturn with its moons is also on there. Um, and also the Cassini uh, spacecraft itself is represented um, just there. Uh, the feathers represent Golden Eagle, whose feathers were used to, for, quill, for quills and um, writing uh, and spreading words of wisdom, which is what this is doing. Um, there's flags that go round in a clockwise direction are uh, in the order of the number of signatures um, by nation uh, that sent in with the United Nations being the, uh, the US being the first one up there. Um, the disc was fitted into a cavity that sat 
right in uh, right in there with a, a special mission patch over it. Uh, and celebrities who signed it included people like Patrick Stewart and Chuck Norris, um, Mary Cassini, who was a descendant of um, uh, uh, Jean Dominique Cassini. She also sent a signature from Australia, and um, Jean Dominique Cassini and Christian Huygens, who the probe was named after also um, signed it because they uh, copied documents from 17th century archived um, scrolls that they'd written. Now Juno, uh, Juno went to uh, Jupiter as well um, in 2011 um, to uh, look at its poles. Now the Juno spacecraft carried three small Lego figures. Um, there was um, Galileo, there was the Roman god Jupiter, because that's what um, uh, the planet it was going to, and his wife Juno, who the, uh, the spacecraft is named after. Um, and the figures were part of a, a joint outreach partnership between NASA and LEGO to try and encourage uh, children into um, STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, now, in Greek, Roman, Greek and Roman mythology, Jupiter drew a veil of clouds around himself to hide himself from mischief. So if you imagine Jupiter is all clouded around, and then Juno comes along and looks through those clouds to peer at what is going on. So this is exactly what this mission did. So it had Juno looking through the clouds of Jupiter to try and have a look what was going on. Um, it also carried on the right there a plaque that was dedicated to uh, Galileo, who um, discovered uh, the moon, the Galilean moons. Um, and this was uh, donated from um, the Italian Museum in Florence. And it also has an inscription on it uh, that was a passage that he made in 1610 when he observed Jupiter, which you can read on there. Uh, moving a bit closer to home now, I'm going to the inner solar system. So we've got the Mars rovers. So we have the workhorses of spirit and opportunity here, which were the, uh, the twin Mars exploration rovers or the MERs, which they were called back in then. Um, and they landed in the 3rd and the 24th of January, 2004 on different sides of Mars. And they confirmed liquid water once flowed across the Martian surface. And they both outlasted their 90 day lifetime, which so rather considerably as well, they went on a lot longer. Than, uh, than anyone anticipated. Now, the name Spirit and Opportunity was selected by NASA students as part of an essay competition that drew nearly 10,000 entries. And it was sponsored by Lego as well, because Lego got heavily involved in this. Um, and um, there was a, a Lego CD there that carried 4 million people's names onto the surface of the Earth. Um, it also included um, construction bricks and an image of an astro bot there that you can see, a little character. Um, and um, there was also secret codes, as you can see around there, printed on the sides. Um, and if you wanted to, you can try and decode those um, as the messages from Mars. So you can go to planetary.org outreach if you wanted to try and decode it. And then if you can't, you can have a look at the solutions to see if you can decode the missions or, or the, the decode the um, uh, mission yourself. Um, now, Spirit, Spirit was um, landed at the Columbia Memorial site, and it was named that in honor of the um, seven astronauts who were killed in the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. And there, there was a hill that had seven peaks which they named each one after one of the astronauts and they became the, uh, the Columbian Hills. Opportunity. Opportunity landed in um, Meridiana Planum. Is that how you pronounce it? Meridiana Planum, yes. Uh, a place where mineral deposits suggested that uh, the Mars had a wet history, so it could try and find um, some signs of uh, geological life there. Uh, and that was named the um, Challenger Memorial Site in honor of the um, astronauts who, uh, part, who perished in the Challenger disaster back in 1986. <clears throat> um, now, as they were, uh, they were launched uh, early in the century, um, the, one of the companies that worked on it was a company called Honeybee Robotics. Um, now, Honeybee Robotics make a lot of um, just 
general robotics around New York. Uh, they're based in New York and they, they can make things like advertising boards and things like that. So every, every so often they get a contract from NASA to do some stuff. Um, and back in um, September, the 11th of September, 2001, um, the story goes that the founder and CEO of um, Honeybee Robotics, a guy called Stephen Gorovan, was driving through um, New York when this happened. Um, now, obviously, being from America and, and being from New York, he was heavily affected by this. Um, people around the world were. Um, but being at the heart of it, he wondered if there was anything he could do. So because he was in New York, he used his connections with the fire department, the mayor and the emergency services to obtain some of the metal from the, um, uh, the Twin Towers when they came down. And what they did is they converted it into spirit and opportunity having pieces of the fallen World Trade Center metal on them that were turned into shields to protect cables on the drilling mechanisms. Um, these pieces of metal with the, uh, the, the American flag on them um, uh, were made from aluminium that was recovered from the site of the World Trade Center towers weeks after their destruction. So there's a permanent memorial of the World Trade Center, both on spirit and opportunity to this day and forevermore on the surface of Mars. Uh, Curiosity Rover. Now, the Curiosity Rover was a, it was a, a megaton. It was just under a ton. In fact, it was the heaviest thing that we landed on uh, Mars at the time. Um, it was launched in November 2011 and landed the early hours of August our time, um, 2012. Now, it contained um, a Lincoln Penny on the Mars camera calibration um, target there. Uh, the penny in this image is part of the uh, camera calibration that's used for the Curiosity rover. Uh, it's the Marley camera um, and the rover to cover images um, on the Martian on the Martian soil on the 9th of September 2012. So what the penny is, is they were using an actual penny. It's sort of a, a nod to geologists in the tradition of placing a coin or another object of known scale next to it so that when they take photographs of something they've got a known scale of what they can do. Um, it also featured as you can see on the uh, on there Joe the Martian who's, who's pictured on there. Um, now he was a character that appeared regularly um, uh, uh, in NASA history and he was created by uh, a guy called Ed Get it was the outreach program at um, Arizona in um, Arizona State University in the 1990s. And it created him when he was at school uh, and it was launched um, as part of the um, Curiosity program and put on the calibration software there, as you can see. Um, also on the plaque, you've got a plaque there on the, uh, the Curiosity rover that was signed by the president at the time, President Obama. Uh, it was also the vice president, who's now the current president, Joe Biden, has signed it. And also other national officials have got it on there. Um, this picture over here are two um, really tiny um, uh, signature chips that carried 1.2 million um, uh, signatures each. Uh, and they're only the size of a, probably a, a, a 10 pence piece. Uh, and they've put them on there and also very cleverly as they always do the um the tires on the curiosity actually spell out jpl in morse code so that as the tires go over there they leave the little imprint of jpl on on the surface of from the wheels perseverance probably the more recent one now that's uh, that was the first time we ever landed a ton over um uh, onto the surface of mars so uh, we all saw that land last year um, and it had a similar design to the, um, uh, the Curiosity rover that I just mentioned, but it also had some hidden signatures in it as well. The parachute that came down, um, an engineer named Ian Clark spelled out um, Dare Mighty Things in binary on the, uh, on the underside. And he also put the, uh, the coordinates of the JPL headquarters around the edge of it as well. So you can see there in binary if imprinted it on there. So that's very clever. Lots of hidden messages going on there. 
Um, the Mars helicopter, as I mentioned earlier, this was really the reason why I started to do this because someone had mentioned that they put the uh, Wright Brothers can uh, canvas aboard the uh, the Ingenuity. And as you can see, little tiny piece that they've put underneath. And again, that will be there forever and a day, poignant as it was the first flight, powered flight on another planet. Um, moving on to asteroids now, uh, very quickly. So this is the, the, the Dawn mission. The Dawn mission went to um, study two asteroids, Vesta and Ceres, back in 2007. Uh, but it carries a micro, a memory chip bearing 360,000 names, which is 364,000 names. So yes, yeah, just over 360,000 names, um, which was part of another public outreach effort. Uh, the microchip chip, which is uh, it's only two centimeters in diameter, and you can see them there, putting it on the uh, the spacecraft, just behind the behind the iron thruster there, behind the main antenna, uh, and they made a backup copy of it that was here that was put on display at the open house event at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in two thousand and seven. At Lucy, this one's very recent. This only launched late last year. Um, this is, mission was named after the uh, Lucy skeleton that was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974 that helped man to understand the evolution of uh, humans. And they're hoping that this Lucy will understand the evolution of the solar system because it's going to uh, the Trojan asteroids, which sit either side of Jupiter uh, and are leftover remnants of the building blocks of the solar system. So it's first going to encounter the uh, the Donald Johansson one there, which is in the um, uh, asteroid belt. And that was named after the co-founder of uh, the Lucy skeleton. And then it's going to fly out to L4, then back round to L5. And then it's going to be in a stable orbit and just keep going backwards and forwards. Um, the Lucy mission carries on the tradition of carrying plaques. Um, but this plaque is not just a time capsule um, for unknown aliens. It's for our own descendants because it's going to be going backwards and forwards in that stable orbit. Um, we can then ev effectively retrieve it because it's going to be going past Earth every so often. Um, it's got quotes on it from uh, various people. There we go. There's the four Beatles. Uh, it also includes Albert Einstein, um, one from Martin Luther King. Uh, one from Carl Sagan, and then one from Brian May. <clears throat> um, low Earth orbit now, so coming nearer to home, mainly going up to the International Space Station and the, um, the Space Shuttle. Um, now, Amelia Earhart, she was um, famous for doing the, uh, the first woman to fly as a passenger, uh, first woman to fly as a passenger across the Atlantic Ocean, um, and she was the legendary aviator um to do her first solo flights um this lady here shannon walker took um amelia earhart's watch up to the international space station and this one here astronaut randy bresnick who's the grandson of um the earhart's only authorized photographer um he took her scarf up on the uh, sts 129 mission in November 2009. So it's Amelia Earhart effectively has been to space and back where some of her belongings have. And then finally onto the space shuttle. Uh, and the space shuttle, uh, it basically had a, um, a, a couple of sessions of what they called toys in space, where astronauts tested the physics of many different toys in space. Um, on the space station and, of course, on the, um, the space shuttle as well. Now, the first batch went up in uh, April 1985 on the Discovery, and it just included 11 toys. Uh, the next set of toys that flew were in 1993. Um, and this went back into orbit with uh, a further 29. And in 1996, um, they took up stuff to the International Space Station and they tested all these different things um, to see how they would go. And they tested 16 toys to learn how the laws of physics would affect the behaviors of toys and students could then relate to them on how they all worked. And they even include, included a little uh, a video resource guide that you could get hold of at the time. 
Um, and then finally, on to uh, public relations. So the one on the left is the uh, is a photo from STS 120. And um, it's the lightsaber that was used by Mark Hamill in the 1983 film Return of the Jedi. And it was flown to the space station in 2007 and then returned to Earth. It was stowed on board the Discovery for the length of the mission. And uh, the pop, the, it was flown in honor of the 30th anniversary of the Star Wars franchise. And then on the right, Buzz Lightyear um, was flown on STS-124 as part of the Disney Parks Year of a Million Dreams. And I believe he spent longer in space than any other human has to date. So that's it. I hope you all learned something and picked up something new. And I hope that kept that interesting. It, it is a brand new talk for me. And uh, you are the first people to see it. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Bill. Excellent. Well done. I learned a lot there. Anybody got any questions? We'll, we'll be able to unmute yourself. So if you've got any questions for Phil, um, just to add, uh, Gus Grissom's hatch, there was a lot of controversy as to whether he'd actually set it off in a panic or not, wasn't it? But I think they now they've recovered the hatch. I think they've now learned that he he didn't and something went amiss and jettisoned the hatch rather than him setting it off early that's it they said in order for him to have set it off manually he'd have had to have do it with some force and his hand wasn't injured and it probably would have had to have been or left some kind of mark for him to have done it um so yeah it, they, did, they did arm and ar it over the time controversy for years over there. yeah yeah definitely yeah but then yeah as a result is um is uh spacecraft went uh, it was a big loss to them at the time because it had obviously lots of data because they recovered all the other ones yeah. and they needed all the flight recording data because they don't have what they've got now where they can just beam it all back so they had to recover it and um uh, process it that way so yeah and say so he nearly died because he was in the water waving as his suit was filling up and everyone thought hi you're right yeah and they concentrate on the spacecraft and then he nearly went down himself yeah yeah any questions phil all very quiet tonight. Or anybody got anything that I've missed? Anything obvious anything. that I haven't included? Um, I'm just curious how you managed to get, get all this information. Um, well, there was a lot of reading going on. Um, I interviewed um, Harold Weinberger. I uh, managed to track him down and he's the world renowned expert on the Robbins medallion. So he gave me lots of information on that. Um, and I even contacted some people at the Smithsonian Center. So I've, I've now got those on Twitter who, uh, who I follow and can message if I've got any uh, uh, questions on that. So that, that, that a good couple of people to have feathers in your cap for. Um, so, yeah, when you've got something to um, uh, to research so and you say, to, I'm going um, to go and research, uh, to research people are more say, open. I'm going to go. And I can hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got something to research, people are more willing to say, oh, yeah, I can help you out with that. But if you just say, hi, I I'm uh, that, trying to do a talk. So. so, yeah, lots of contacts I've made doing this because it's taken nearly a year to, 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 to do. Yeah, very good. And there's probably loads missing. Mm. It's, it's time as well. I, I didn't know how long that was going to take. So it's probably about an hour, that one. So that was it was quite good. Yeah, the, the European Space Agency, would you inc include them? Could you include them, perhaps? I could do, but they don't do things as um, as far and wide. That the, They're less frequent. So the, whether there's enough mileage to be able to do an hour talk or not, because yeah. for NASA, I had to go all the way back to sort of the 1960s, late, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and they are steeped with tradition and history. Um, Whereas ESA are probably more commercialised because they didn't come around till 1975. Um, and while during the uh, the 80s, all of the three big companies, uh, the Americans, the Russians and the European Space Agency were doing different things. So you've got NASA who are trying to do manned space flight. You've got the Russians who are doing um, um, space stations and uh, ESA who were concentrating on a launcher, which is where the Ariane programme came from. So they launch a lot of things, but they haven't really sent many things anywhere um not with any um 
any of this any of this kind of traditional or commemorative items on it and there might be one or two that i could include but i just thought nasa does nostalgia just keep it nasa it just sounded nice nice as a working title yeah very good Anybody else? Well, just a quick thought. Um, yep. There was a film made called, I think it's called Hidden Figures. Like yes. The early days of space. Yep. And, it's about and Catherine the Johnson, of ladies it? who did all the calculations. That's Is it, there yep. any credit given to them at all in any of the nostalgia? Um, not not from the ones that I've come up with. I think there might be some new things now because um, uh, didn't she pass away not so long ago, just at the age of 100? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think in they're getting the credit they deserve, but there's not anything yeah. that I know of. I think they did a um, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, the ATVs, the shuttles that go up to take stuff to um, at the International Space Station. I think one of those might have been named after her, but I don't know that for sure. Because no. I know they try. I know there's a, a a few that they've named after people. Well, assuming that the the film, you know, sort of depicts the mm -hmm. actually what happened, I think they should get a lot of, a lot of credit for it. Oh yeah, definitely. I think they have got a lot of credit. Whether, whether they're going to send anything um, uh, up in their honour, but I think they will do. Yes, eventually. I think there is a building named. <coughs> excuse me. After. Um... Johnson, isn't there? On uh, in NASA, is it is it um, Catherine or Kathleen? I can't remember her name. Yeah, there yeah. is a Kathleen Johnson building that's been dedicated to her in her honour. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. yeah. So there's loads. The, of the stuff film was actually on tonight as well while I was having my dinner. It was on uh, oh. again. It's been on a lot recently. Yeah. So whether they sent anything into space in their honour or not, I don't know. I'd have to look into that. That's a good question. There's probably lots that have happened that I've not been able to pick up on because there's so many that NASA have done. Um, but yeah, Catherine Johnson was, a, as I was saying, a, an amazing person. I don't think they would have managed to, to do half the stuff that they did, the human calculator. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Well, I learned a lot tonight, Phil. So uh, thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Anybody else got any questions before we uh, make our way? Just a quick one, Dave. Have you heard anything about the um, the space show? You know, normally they have one in March. I think Kettering, somewhere over that way, um, a free exhibition type thing. Have you heard anything about that? It's meant to be going ahead. I did have a slide for it, but I didn't show that tonight. Uh, let me just get the dates for that. And I'll, uh... Why do you think it takes so long when you... Uh... Waiting for them. The date for that is the 19th of March, if it still goes ahead. That's at Kettering. It's the Practical Astronomy Show. That's the one, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have confirmed it's still going ahead. See if I can find well, the link. Northampton had a stand for that, didn't they, on the last one? They did, I don't yeah. know if uh, Nick's, Nick Hewitt is. Um, putting anything forward there. Yeah, we, we're going to be there um, with Ned Valley Astronomers again. We've, we've got a place we've book, yeah. we're booked in. Yeah. Okay, well, just let me know and I can uh, put yeah. my pen with in. Yeah, um, we all. I'll just pop a link into cool. the chat and I'll pop all these on the uh, website anyway when I get a mo. <clears throat> Any other questions for Phil? Just quickly looking through the chat and Graham's asked, is it correct that the Apollo 15 crew never flew again because of the stamp scandal? And yes, that's true. They didn't. They were uh, they were heavily reprimanded for it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just having a quick look to see if there's anything in chat. No, that was the only question. OK, brilliant. Well, well good. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, lightning talk. That's, um, brilliant. As per usual. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. Had a good turnout again. So uh, good to see that the uh, virtual astronomy show is uh, still living and breathing and uh, carrying on into the new year. So uh, let's hope it improves yeah. everybody. And uh, yeah, let's just hope. Keep fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, then. Yes, Dave. Well done, mate. And, and thanks, thanks for the talk, Phil. It was excellent. Right. Thank thanks, you. Phil.
Very good. Yeah, Thank thanks, you, Phil. Phil. Thanks, Dave. Okay, have anybody got anything else they'd like to add before we go? Not necessarily related to Phil's talk. What about your fold up model for your James Webb? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, show, I'll quickly show you that. Um, have you unfolded it day by day? <laughs> <laughs> model, but it's solid, so you can't unfold it. Oh, well, that's glad the real one's not like that. Yeah, the real one didn't do that. Yeah, so, uh, but that's nice because we've got a 3D printed model of the unfolded scope. I've also got one to compare to say, look, this is what it looked like when it was uh, inside the nose cone of the rocket. That's really that nice. Cool. So I see someone's done a mock-up in Lego of the of the James Webb telescope, and it looks absolutely awesome. So I think they're trying to see if they can forward the idea to produce it. You mean this or, one? No, <laughs> no, it's, it's all it all properly unfolds apart from the uh, the uh, solar fields. It's eight point five meters wide. Yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> but that, that's the one I can afford. Yeah. <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you would you would have seen. Yeah, that. we saw that. Mm. Yeah, that's not ten billion dollars. Yeah, it will fold with the right amount of pressure, though. You can afford it. Yeah. I bet. I bet Lego will do one in a minute. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Yes. Mm. Big curiosity, didn't they? Yeah. 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 Okay, then, folks. Right. Well, thanks everybody for coming right. in. Right, thanks, Phil, for a brilliant talk. And uh, we'll see you in uh, about a month or so's time, or just slightly more. Yeah. Okay, so take yes. care. January, right. and uh, see you later. You know what I'm going to say? Hey, Roger. Yeah. Keep, keep looking up. Keep well. Yeah. Keep Cheers, keep safe. Cheers. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.